so let's see if this one works. This is broadcast two. Now, the Spirit of God is t telling people, so he's telling people what's going to happen. He wants us to know it's going to happen, and he's telling us what's going to happen so that we respond the right way to the future. Why does God tell us what he tells us? So that we respond to things the right way. So bitterness describes a prolonged, deep sense of frustration or anger or sadness. Joshua was told of the Lord to only be strong and very courageous. So the Lord was telling Joshua because Joshua had seen a whole lot, a whole lot. For the last 40 years of Joshua's life, he had seen people prosper and people fail. He had seen a lot of, of the miraculous and a lot of death. Now, those are two opposite ends of life's spectrum. The blessings and death. He saw it. He saw it. He saw it. Many, many people, if not most of the people that he left Egypt with because Joshua was a Hebrew slave when he was born. But at some point in his life, the Lord sent a man named Moses, who was, a, who was also Hebrew. He was a Hebrew. And he was of the tribe of Levi. The Lord sent Moses to get the Hebrews from Egypt so that they could live a new life as God's royal priests. So yes, these people are going to live a brand new life. So they had responsibilities. So the Spirit of God sent Moses to Egypt to gather the Hebrews to confront Pharaoh, to tell Pharaoh that God commands Pharaoh to release the nation of Israel. Eventually, Pharaoh does. After many judgments from God on the nation of Egypt, Pharaoh eventually complies, and the Hebrews are eman emancipated. They're liberated. They're set free. You guys can go. And many of the Egyptians gave the Hebrews many material things for their new lives, their new journey. And so the nation of Israel, they are now free. Egypt does pursue, but then God destroys Pharaoh and the rest of the Egyptian army. Now the nation of Israel, so Joshua was among the Hebrews freed from Egypt and sent through the wilderness because the wilderness is not a permanent place. David says, yes, though I walk through, so the valley of the shadow of death. So bitterness can describe a belief, a, 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 a condition of discouragement, a condition of discouragement that causes disobedience or a lack of faith. So that's what bitterness can describe. If, if I say that I'm bitter, I am saying that I am stuck in a place of sadness, anger, aggravation, frustration, or fear. I am saying that my emotions, my heart, isn't responding to any encouragement or any promises of God to the degree that I can, I feel differently because we live based on our feelings. And you say, no, 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 I'm not controlled by my feelings. Well, then what are you controlled by? I'm controlled by my faith. Well, you know your faith works with your feelings. If your faith does not work with your feelings, you're not going to make any decisions. Your feelings have to support your decision making. Your feelings describe the inner desire. You've got to desire to do whatever it is that you want to do. Now, you may desire to do something that you're not supposed to do, but your faith will tell you that there are things that you are supposed to do and the desires to do what you're supposed to do at some point will override or win the fight against the desires that want to do the wrong thing. 
So Jesus, as he sought the Father, needed the power to do what the Father wanted him to do, even though his body wanted to do something that he wasn't supposed to do. So we need the power of God to make, to act on our hearts and minds, to fill our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, equipping us to do what the Father wants us to do, even though we have feelings of fear or discouragement. We need the power of God, which manifests as love, which manifests as, as peace, which manifests as joy and patience. We, we need the power of God producing sensations and thinking strength to think the thoughts I'm supposed to think strength to get my body to make these decisions as opposed to wrong decisions we need the power of God to help our hearts to make the right decisions so either way you are controlled by your emotions now what we mean when we say that we're not controlled by emotions is that we're saying that our emotions can either be controlled by the sinful nature or our emotions can be subjected to the spirit that's on the inside of us either way your body is a vehicle your desires are vehicles and you are either going your faith is going to control the body or sin is going to control the body. The body is prone to do the wrong thing, but faith, which is our access to Father God, God gives us the power to have access to him, and that power enables and produces love. That love equips us to make decisions that please God. That joy, that peace, that long-suffering, that faith, that gentleness, so, I, may, I might be an aggressive person, an unkind, an ungrateful person, but the power of God producing gratitude, thankfulness, affection can control my body. So, I can have hatred in my sinful heart or in this. So, so hatred can, can attempt to control my heart. Or the love of God can control my heart. Either way, my heart needs to be controlled. My heart is a part of what's going on. So either way, your heart is a part of what's going on. Your mind is a part of what's going on. You are not working outside of your heart. The power of God is controlling your thoughts, controlling your emotions, enabling you to make the right decisions. Because if the power of God is not controlling your thoughts or emotions, then the sin, which is a spiritual power, is going to control your thoughts and emotions, producing fear. The Spirit of God works with the heart, producing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, mercy. The, the, and then, of course, you have the spirit of sin. Sin is a spirit. Okay, It's a spiritual condition. It's a spirit. Ephesians 2, 2 makes that clear. Jesus makes that clear in John 8. Paul preaches that in Romans 6. He that serves sin is of or from the devil. When we do what God wants, Jesus said, that I'm not the one doing these miracles. The Father is in me doing the works. Jesus was saying the power of the Father, which is the very presence of the Father himself, is what makes me do the things I do, say the things I say. Jesus told the religious leaders of his day, I've got a lot of things to say, but I can only say what the Father tells me to say. There are a lot of things I can do. I can judge you all for your decision making. I can call down legions of angels to help me get free from this group attempting to apprehend me. But I am going to do what the Father tells me to do. I'm not going to do what... My, what sin, so sin is not just the breaking of God's will or law. It is also a spirit. So when we sin, we are being motivated by a spirit. You've got a spirit in this body. When we sin, we, we are being motivated by a spirit. Jesus made that very plain in John 8. He that commits sin is the servant. If you commit the act, you're the servant of the entity. Jesus said that if you receive him, you receive the one who sent him. He says, if you do what I tell you to do, it's the, it's the spirit of the Father in you doing that. If you do what the devil tells you to do, it's because there's a spirit. There's a curse. It's, a, it's an actual spirit, though. 
Many spirits. It's a, the word of God in, his, in Isaiah calls it a covering. Calls it a covering. I forget where, the, where that is. But Isaiah prophesies that God's going to remove the covering that's been cast over the earth. And he's going to cause the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And so sin is a condition, or we would call that death. But it's also, but it's a spiritual condition. It's a spiritual force. And it thinks. It's a thinking force. A rational, intelligent force. And it's destructive. It destroys. And so the Spirit of God wants us to know that so that we can overcome the influence of sin. Bitterness paralyzes me, positioning me to sin. Bitterness is a paralyzing force in the emotions, a paralyzing condition of heart and mind that caused me to sin, that causes me to sin. Bitterness causes me to do wrong. It is what Paul describes as giving place to the devil. So when we are angry or frustrated for a prolonged period of time over a matter or over a number of matters, we are being paralyzed or arrested or controlled so that we sin. That's what that force does. And we don't adequately confront things that we feel that we shouldn't be feeling, or if we don't, we don't, we don't adequately respond to circumstances. Then eventually, the effect that circumstance has on us causes the sin in us to gain more control over the thinking patterns and the desires. So when Hebrews warns us about the roots of bitterness, he's describing emotional conditions and spiritual conditions of anger or fear or frustration or agitation or sadness that prevent us from doing what we're supposed to do. Hebrews twelve fifteen, looking diligently or as we'd say, focused, looking diligently, constantly evaluating what your obligations are, constantly thinking about Jesus and what his will is, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. It is possible to fail of the grace of God, to miss out on the fact that God is being good to people. It's possible to miss out on the fact that God is being good to us. So the grace of God is the power from God to be who God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do. That's what grace is. Grace is the strength of God to do what he's telling you to do like he's telling you to do it. But it's possible to fail in that just like it's possible for me to. And we won't have any fire experiments, even though I have ideas of having fire experiments. But the last time we had a fire experiment... I actually almost burned down the set here. So, you know, fire and plastic, you know, plastic burns a lot quicker than I thought it did. I won't work with that tonight, at least, unless I have a fire extinguisher on hand. Or I've got my trusty water. But this is a plastic bottle of water. If I were to burn a hole in the top of it, it doesn't matter that this water is good and that it's refreshing and hydrating, it's going to leak out. If I put this fire right here, this water is going to leak out. And so, yes, water was put into the receptacle, into the container. Water was put in here. Grace is given. So the, the, the preacher is talking about something in Hebrews 12, 15. He says, God is gracious to man, but man does have to confront the condition of his heart. There's a very, very powerful scripture in, oh, wow, I should see if I, let's see if I can find it. Solomon is praying, and he calls sin a plague. He calls the propensity to sin a plague. What does that word mean? The likely, the, the, 
desire and the ability to do wrong. He calls that sin or a plague. And 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 but he, but he, I think he also no. I think I am thinking of something that he said in the Proverbs. He talks about the heart that knows its own bitterness. And I don't really remember where that is. But the Word of God talks about the heart knowing its own bitterness. I thought initially it was when Solomon was praying. But I believe, so he calls, he calls sin a plague. In, 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 he calls it the plague of heart. You know, the word plague means disease. The plague of heart. And so in, in 1 Kings that Solomon is praying, he's talking about the plague or the sickness of heart. The sickness of heart. So sin is a sickness. It is a spiritual force. It is an active spiritual force. Solomon in Second Chronicles 6.36 says, and If they sin against you, for there is no man which sins not. He says that people sin. People make decisions because they are being motivated by a spiritual force in their bodies, in their souls. There are spiritual forces in our atmosphere. There are spiritual forces in our body that move us, drive us, motivate us to make decisions that bring death and destruction in our own lives and in the lives of others. Faith is the knowledge and awareness of God's presence and his will and his promises. And it causes the heart to love. It causes the heart to rejoice. It causes the heart to forgive. It causes the heart to understand. The faith of God streams into the life of man, enabling man to understand, enabling man to feel what man needs to feel in order to do what he's required to do. Because God is gracious to us. But if there are holes in our hearts through bitterness, like ulcers, an ulcer essentially is, from my understanding, my limited medical knowledge of things, of the body, practically like a hole or a sore that's a hole on the stomach and i suppose you can have ulcers in more than pla in more than one place but essentially it's describing a wound or some kind of abrasion on the lining of the stomach that uh, that causes the acid to that can cause the acid that's in the stomach to to come out and so uh uh if, if if that's the right de definition or if that's the right description of that. We know we don't want holes in our gas tank. We don't want holes in our brake line. We don't want holes in the, the engine. We don't want holes in our pockets. We don't want holes in our liver. We don't want holes in our hearts. We don't want holes in our lungs. We don't want holes in our brains. We don't want anything that's supposed to be properly contained and used for good to be leaking out. Well, what happens when God is good to us, but when there's bitterness? And so we see how bitterness can really negatively impact the people of God. Bitterness can hurt you because it is a paralyzing hardening condition of mind and, and, and heart disabling us from doing what God wants us to do. Damaging us. Preventing us from doing what God wants us to do. God wants us to do this. But whatever God commands man to do requires courage. It requires love. It requires freedom to do it. David called the refreshing of God. He called, he called the Spirit of God the, the free Spirit of God. Now that's interesting. I was reading that today. We were reading that today. And it says in the Word, it says, Uphold me with your free Spirit. This is David praying in Psalm 51. He asks God to uphold him with his free Spirit. Now the implications of that title are vast. What is the Spirit of God revealing about himself when he has David call call him 
the free spirit. Now we know him as the Holy Spirit. We know him as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. But the free spirit of God? Lord, uphold me with your free spirit. What does it mean, the free spirit? This is the spirit that makes free. This is the spirit that brings freedom. This is the spirit that causes people to act in ways that bring them freedom, that act in ways that allow them to be free from the influence of sin. This is a spirit that is not under the control of evil. This is a spirit that is not limited. This is a spirit that is given to man, though man does not deserve that level of access to God. This is a spirit that operates throughout the universe. Lord, uphold me with your free spirit, your spirit that is free and makes free. Lord, you are holy and you make holy. Lord, you are free. There's no darkness in you, no weakness in you, no limitation in you. You are free. You are all powerful. You don't have boundaries. You don't have limitations. And in my life, as you, God, are in my life, I don't have those boundaries. I don't have those limitations. We, we, we do what God enables us to do. And we don't do what God tells us not to do. The free spirit of God enables us. The moving spirit of God, the spirit that moves at his own will. That's, 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 what, that's what we need. We need the fr David says, uphold me with your free spirit. And so there are a lot of implications to that title. The free spirit of God. So bitterness then brings slavery to a situation and a bad belief or a bad emotional reaction to a situation. If I am bitter, I am a slave to a situation. So, so if I'm bitter, if I'm bitter, I am under the control of a situation. I'm under the control of a spirit. I'm under the control of, an, of a bad experience or something or my bad response to a good experience. So when Jesus heals this guy, the guy can't walk, he's paralyzed. And Jesus looks at the man and says to him, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now the religious leaders up to this point in this area accepted Jesus. They approved of him. They supported his ministry, many of them, until that moment. And once he says to that man, your sins are forgiven, in Matthew chapter 9, at that point, they were offended. They were angered at this man making those statements. How, how could he make that statement? They were thinking that he was out of line, that he was in error. How could he make that statement? He can't make that statement. Who can forgive sins except God? But, you know, who can forgive, forgive sins but God? Only, only God can forgive sins. This man can't. This, not, this man's not allowed to forgive sins. So, from that point, they began to hate him. Now, he'd make other decisions that would make some of them hate him. But from that point, they began to hate him. That wasn't a bad scenario, but they responded to it out of anger and confusion and ignorance they didn't know that this man was the savior of the world they should have been looking for the savior of the world but the savior of the world had not come and it had been over a thousand years probably since he was promised to come longer than that depending on whose prophecy we're using so i mean it's been a thousand plus years the Jews are expecting a political ruler to rise and free them. They don't know who it's going to be. But they definitely don't expect any person to be telling people to be conferring forgiveness as though the person himself is God. No, no, no. Political change you can bring. But you can't tell people 
if their if their decisions are actually going to benefit them or cause them suffering as though you yourself are in charge of whether their decisions are going to cause them suffering or not. You're not in charge of whether that man's decisions are going to cause him pain or not. You can only say what God is saying. They couldn't recognize Emmanuel. Isaiah told them Emmanuel was coming. Isaiah told them that God would be manifest in human form. Isaiah told them that. But Isaiah told them that over 400, over 500 years ago. They had his writings, but it was too difficult for them to accept his writings as occurring right now. That's why there are many of us that have the writings, but it's too difficult for us to accept the fact that the occurrences described in this book are occurring right now. We can't, we can't fathom that because it's been almost 2,000 years. And so many can't conceptualize that we are seeing the spirit of Antichrist take position in global government. We can't accept that it's true. And so we're distracted with material things and entertainment, entertainment things. And, but the Holy Ghost would have us to know that whether you are prepared for these events or not, all creation is setting up for these events to occur because God is going to return to earth and govern it in a direct way. And he is positioning himself to do that. And all of the events leading up to that must occur. He's telling people that he's doing this. Love for God and for those in front of me as a single law. i got to love God and love people in front of me according to his will. That equips me, that equips us to prepare for his return. That's what the word of God says. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love doesn't know God because bitterness has the ability to blind us. Now, there's a bitterness that comes with poverty. There are human responses to poverty and human responses, their natural responses to poverty and to wealth. Their natural responses to poverty and wealth. So, this prophet prays in Proverbs 30, asks God not to make him too rich because he responds he says, pride is a form of bitterness. And he says, it, Lord, if you make me too rich, I am capable of negatively responding to wealth with pride. And I'm able to dismiss God. That's what the guy says in Proverbs 30. But then he also says bitterness could cause him to. He's saying that experiencing too much material things over an extended period of time, after a while, can affect him emotionally, can cause pride, which describes a, a, a certain spiritual reaction on the heart. He's saying, listen, I can make some bad decisions if I am too rich for too long. I am capable of of being proud, of being ignorant and dismissive of the Lord. But then he also says, but if I'm poor for too long, I am capable of desperation that would motivate me to steal, to take what's not mine. So bitterness describes prolonged bad emotion, a prolonged bad desire, a prolonged bad condition of heart. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual condition that also is operating in the body, operating in the soul. So sin is a spirit that affects the body, affects the mind, affects the heart, affects the physical world. It's a spiritual condition. It's a spirit that affects the world. So Bitterness paralyzes and prevents obedience to God. So the prophet Agur says, don't make me too rich for too long. Don't make me too poor for too long. Father, give me what I am supposed to have because that's what I have the capacity to manage. That's what he says. 
Because I don't want to... So, there's a bitterness that comes with wealth that can come with wealth. There's a bitterness that can come with poverty. So, these experiences affect our mental and emotional lives. It affects your life. It affects your decision making. How you feel affects your thinking and your decision making. How you feel. So God could be good to us. Joshua experienced the goodness of God. Joshua passed through the Red Sea. But he had brothers and sisters with him, Hebrew brothers and sisters with him, that were bitter. Poverty and slavery and idolatry had caused them to be impatient, caused them to be contentious, caused them to be lustful and idolatrous. And they were aggressive. And so, as Moses was leading them through the Red Sea, out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, when things did not go as they wanted them to go, they began to get angry. They began to get frustrated. They began to want to go back to Egypt. They began to make decisions or to desire to make decisions that were contrary to the purpose for which they were freed. The... the the, the psalmist calls the Holy Ghost the free spirit of God, meaning he is completely beautiful, completely loving. He is not defiled. He's light. He's not controlled by any evil. He is the free moving, free being spirit of God. Lord, your spirit is free. You are holy. You are awesome. Freedom describes holiness. It describes how it describes perfection. Lord, your spirit is free. So Joshua believes that God's going to be with him and the Hebrews on this journey. So he does not disobey. The Hebrews are so convinced that bad is good, that fear is all, that fear is justified, that impatience is is a right view of the world. No, this should happen by now. How do you know it should happen by now? My feelings, my perspectives tell me this should be this way. And if God were really with us, this is what would be happening. So bitterness causes us to look at things from the perspective of fear, pride, Anger. And when those emotions, those desires control us, when they win, when we are slaves to those bad experiences, and like the Hebrews, we will begin to despise God. It's inevitable. The prophet declared it was possible. And we won't, as Joshua did, make it to the promised land, which for us is a reference to eternal life. If you and I don't make it to the promised land, we're talking about missing eternity with Jesus. That cannot be an option. There's a man in the scriptures who we see overcame bitterness. Now, this is what I mean by that. So a very popular, maybe not so much now, but Early 2000s, the first decade of the, of the, of the 2000 millennia, the 2000th millennia, millennium, millennia, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, after Jesus left the planet, about 2,000 years later, the church began to talk about, the church in America at least, this man who has a very limited record in our Bible. We hear about him one time and we don't hear about him before or after that. And his name is, you guessed it, Jabez. 
his name describes the fact that his mother gave birth to him with a lot of suffering. So in chapter 4 of First Chronicles, the record of the Hebrew lineage, it tells us about a man named Jabez. He must have been of the tribe of Judah, but we don't know who his father was or his mother was. Let me see. Well, maybe, let's see. if Does it give us her name? It doesn't give us her name. It just introduces him in verses 9 and 10. It just introduces him. We can assume that the people talked about in verse 8 and 11 are his family. That we don't have any uh, we don't have any uh, any uh, direct statement that would affirm that. Jabez is a testimony God wanted to insert in the midst of all of these all of these Hebrew genealogies. He could have been a very bitter person. Again, what does bitter mean? Prolonged anger. Anger, holding, harboring anger from day to day. Harboring fear from day to day. Harboring lust from day to day. And the damage it does to the heart, because that's what it does. It damages the heart, causing the heart to be fearful. Angry, angry. So, or sad, where even when good things are happening, the heart still senses the sadness, the anger, the fear, the rebellion, the hatred caused by an experience or a group of experiences. And now the heart has decided that it believes this about life. It believes that life is bad. It believes that people are dangerous. It believes that suffering is inevitable. That's what the bitter heart says. And so as survivors, the bitter heart does what it thinks. It controls the body to make decisions it thinks will give it some measure of satisfaction against the will of God, against the word of God. So Jabez, his mother had hard labor, maybe even a hard pregnancy, but it simply says she gave birth to him or she bare him with sorrow. Verse, eight, verse 9 of First Chronicles 4, and Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. What does it mean to be honorable? It means to live a certain way that causes people to listen to you when you talk, to, live, to make decisions that motivate people to take your advice, to take your counsel, to make room for you, to ensure that you are okay. That's what it means when, when you are honorable. People want to be with you. They believe the things you say are true. They believe that what you do is of value and should be thought about and replicated. That's what it means to be honorable. Oh, we honor this person. When he talks, we listen. When she talks, we listen. We approve what he does, what she does. Because we believe that what he does is what should be done. We believe that he is a standard for how people ought to think and be. That's what it means to be honorable. Like, oh, I honor you. Meaning, I respect what you say. I listen when you talk. I make decisions that you'd make. I consider you when I make decisions. It's important to me that you approve of what I do, that you affirm me because you are honorable. It says he was more honorable. He would make good decisions, even though his name meant that his mother gave birth to him with sorrow. He could have been angry about that. He could have allowed that to determine how he treated others, how he treated his mother, how he made decisions, because that's what bitterness does. It causes us to make decisions motivated by fear, anger, pride, rebellion, and sadness, and hatred. That's what bitterness does, because we feel it, and we make decisions based on our feelings, that's why the Lord tells us to love God with all your heart, 
your mind, your soul, your strength. He's saying, let God's spirit dominate your heart with love. Feel love. Accept that love or that joy or that peace is the way to feel because it's streaming in. Don't think about the bad things. Allow God to heal you of the traumatic experiences and allow him to give you understanding about the matters. Allow him to take away the anger, the hatred, the fear, the pride, the lust, the sadness. Ask him to take away the damage done to the heart and mind so that you are not reacting based on these fears, these things that make you angry, these these, these these angering experiences because the writer of Hebrews, the preacher of Hebrews warns us that these bitter conditions of heart can choke us, destroy us, get us off course. So, he said. so Jabez's mother gave birth to him and she had a hard labor or pregnancy. It says she gave birth to him with sorrow, and she named him that. She could have damaged his life, but his life was a response to the goodness and power of God as opposed to the raw deal he got from his family. His mother called him Jabez. When Rachel was dying, she was giving birth to Benjamin in the process. She died as a result of the hard labor. And bringing forth and giving giving birth to her her second son Benjamin. And as she was dying, she gave him a name, son of my sorrow. She made a decision out of deep sadness to name her son. She wanted his name to represent her sorrow. So did Jabez's mother. I want their names to represent. The hardship I went through just to have them. And then this other lady, she did the same thing. She was Eli's daughter-in-law, the priest, the high priest Eli in the days of Samuel. She was the high priest's daughter-in-law. She was Phineas's wife. Phineas was Eli's son. I think that's Phineas and Hophni. I think Phineas's wife, one of the, one of the son's wives, she was dying because... She went into premature labor. Labor was too hard for her. She was so burdened by the fact that her husband just died and her father-in-law just died. In the, in the same day, she was pregnant. She began to go into premature labor. And as she's dying because the, of the suffering of her heart, mind, and body, they tell her, don't be sad. Your son, you, you gave birth to a son. And so she says, name him Ichabod. And that meant the glory of God has left the children of Israel. The glory of God has left the area. The glory of God has departed. So it's possible for someone, a parent or someone that was over you or with you at a very precious stage of your life to make a decision that endangers you or that causes you to be disregarded, disrespected, rejected by those around you. So we've, we've experienced things that have caused others to distance themselves from us or to mistreat us, to treat us hatefully, to do things that cause us pain and suffering. And so this was an example of that. Jabez's mother gave him a name that represented him being a bad person. Yes, he caused me sorrow when I was being born. His life will probably be that same thing. He'll probably be causing people sorrow throughout the rest of their lives. So let's name him that. She named him Jabez. Meant so that way people could watch him. Be careful for that guy. He's a, he's a troublemaker. He, he caused his mother trouble. He'll probably cause all of us trouble. His name is Jabez. But it says that his decision making was inconsistent with the curse his mother put on him. His mother put a curse on him. So Rachel called her son Benoni, son of my sorrow. Jacob, though he loved Rachel and obviously did not want her to die, 
made a decision that will not be her, my, this son's name. His name will be, be Ben Yamin, Benjamin. No, son of my right hand, not son of sorrow. I know you died, and I love you, and I don't want you to have died. Buried her on the way from one place to another. But he changed, the father came in and changed the name of the son that the mom cursed him by. Oh, it's Ben Onai, and she died. No, 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 don't name him. His, his name will not be Ben Onai. His name will be Benjamin, Benjamin, Ben, son of my right hand, not son of my sorrow. So God graciously turned the curse into a blessing in that situation. Well, in Jabez's situation, Jabez was not controlled by bitterness. The mom said the mom cursed him with his name. She wanted his name to represent the fact that he was going to cause people problems because he caused her problems in childbirth. Call him Jabez. It's a baby. Call him Jabez. This is a sign he's going to be a bad person. And so he 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 gets older and he begins to make decisions that say he's not his name. He's not a troublemaker. He's not a sorrow causer. He's not contentious. He doesn't make things hard for people. He's honorable. He makes decisions that we should make. His name is Jabez. His name might mean he causes trouble, but his decisions don't say that. And so even though when they hear his name, they might think to protect themselves from his influence. When they watch his decisions, they say, no, 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 no. This guy needs to be listened to. He makes productive decisions. So you could have a curse on your life that could cause you to act in fear or aggression or rebellion or hatred. Or you could be mindful of God because it says that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez because I bear him with sorrow. And verse 10 tells us what made him honorable. It says, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. So though his mother cursed him. With a name that meant he was a troublemaker, a sorrow causer. The Lord gave him grace to think about God, to think about the Father, to think about the mercies of God, and to seek God for that mercy to be active in his life. And Jabez called, sought after, pursued, thought on, obeyed the God of his father Abraham, his ancestor Abraham. Jabez called on the God of Israel who, drove, who, who walked the Israelites through the Red Sea, through the wilderness 40 days. Their feet did not swell, though they walked all around all the time for 40 years. Their, their, their clothes did not rot, did not become old. Their shoes did not get old. They didn't wear out in the desert. They didn't die. The Lord provided for them water out of rocks twice he gave them food from heaven from the sky he the lord was constantly good to these people jabez called on that god yeah jabez called on that god he called on the god of israel and this is what he prayed and this is how we see he overcame we, we see he was overcoming he was not a slave to the moment his mother called him Jabez having everybody else to now be defensive when they're around this guy protective protected like no this guy's name is Jabez that means he's a troublemaker his mother called him that so we got we need to watch him well Jabez was focused on the solution not the problem when we're focused on the problem, that's evidence of bitterness. When we're focused on the solution, that's evidence of faith. How do I know, David? How do I know I'm, I'm controlled by bitterness? I am, my emotional condition is based on the problem or the solution. If my emotional state is based on the solution, then I, I'm not focused, then I'm not bitter. If my emotions are based on the problem, then I'm bitter. I don't have to die that way. You don't have to die that way. But that's the indicator. One of the major indicators. Jabez called on the God of Israel. And this is what he said. Oh, that you'd bless me when my father and mother forsake me. You'll take me up. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Bless me for real. I want to see your blessing. And then he says, and that your hand might be with me. What was he saying? When I make decisions, God, I need you to support the decisions I make. 
I need it to be evident that something above the natural is happening in my life. I need, I need there to be proof that the hand of God is with me, that I am not controlled by the weaknesses of my world. No, I need it, I need it to be evidence that God is with me. Oh, that you would bless me. If man doesn't bless me, make him. If man won't listen to me and I need to be listened to, make him. If I'm in position to suffer, protect me. Oh, that you'd bless me indeed, that you'd enlarge my coast. What was he asking God for? Lord, I want territory to control. God, my identity does not permit me, my my. My heritage from my mother does not permit me to be blessed or to have the blessing. I, I need the blessing of God. My mother called me a troublemaker, but I need power from you so that I don't act like a troublemaker and so that people don't treat me like a troublemaker. Because I don't want to act like a troublemaker. We don't want people to... Not treat us like we're troublemakers if we have the potential to cause them problems. Right? You don't want people to make to accept you if you're a danger to them. No. You don't want to be a danger to people. Jabez says, Lord, that you'd bless me indeed. For real. Let it be a tangible. I need the tangible blessings of God in my life. I need the evidence of God's hand. God, give me region. Give me a region to run. Let your hand be with me. Be with me. Don't let me get out here. I need to know how to go in and come out. I need to succeed when I make decisions, not fail. That your hand would be with me and that you would protect me, that you keep me from evil so that it doesn't grieve me, so that it doesn't embitter me, so that it doesn't, so that it doesn't make me hateful and angry and violent and contentious and hurtful and rebellious. Lord, I need you to keep me from evil that it might not grieve me. And how did God respond to Jabez at the end of verse 10, 1 Chronicles 4, 10? It says, and God granted him that which he requested. The Holy Ghost would have us know that bitterness is a curse if you let it be. Because it'll paralyze you and it'll cause creation to respond to you as though you are capable of hurting it. Bitterness is an emotional Spiritual condition that causes me to see the world as a dangerous place that I need to do bad things to in order to have some measure of pleasure or peace or satisfaction or comfort. Grace tells me that God is available to me and He's over all. If God is available to me and he is over all, then I've got to focus on him and not on the problem. We identify the problem and we cast it before the Lord. We do what Hezekiah did. We take the problem to God consistently enough not to be controlled by bitterness, anger, fear, sadness, pride, because it can bitterness can stop us from obeying God. Because it can control our heart. And whatever controls our hearts controls our destinies. That's why we ought to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, minds, strength. And our neighbor, the people that we live closest with, as ourselves. It is an act. It's an act. And so we need grace to be holy. We need grace to be faithful. We need grace. We need freedom from bitterness. Jabez could have responded to the rejection of his mother and maybe his peers. And then he would not have had a reputation of honor. The man had a reputation of honor. That guy is honorable. I know his name is Jabez, but he is not his name. That's what we need. We need. We need. 
our attitudes affect our reputation. The man's name meant that he causes sorrow. But his decisions said he was a man of honor. We cannot be men of honor if we are bitter. And if we are obedient, we will be men of honor. If we obey, if we seek and believe God, if we overcome bitterness, anger, frustration, by calling on the God of Israel, the solution, we're going to have peace like a river that goes beyond comprehension and understanding. This is your brother David Williams with Jesus Ministries. It's time to seek the Lord, brothers. Jesus is coming. Let's prepare ourselves for that.